the trumpet and loudly they ring, Jesus is coming again. Cheer up, you pilgrims, be joyful and sing, Jesus is coming again. From Los Angeles, California, we present the program of the Voice of Prophecy, a voice crying in the wilderness of these latter days, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Coming again, coming again, Jesus is coming again. And now we invite you to listen to our program and share with us the mutual blessing and inspiration of this hour together. Shepherd of Israel, a glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of thy sanctuary. We thank thee for the gift of thy beloved Son, who, although harmless and undefiled, died for our sins and rose again. We thank thee that we have such an high priest, who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister of the sanctuary and the true tabernacle, there to make intercession for us that his worthy intercession may be effectual in behalf of all who hear this broadcast, we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. to the world. As we approach the third anniversary of the Voice of Prophecy as a world broadcast, 
We feel that you will want the very brief but thrilling story of progress. This gospel broadcast may now be heard in nearly every land from beautiful Hawaii to sunny South Africa and from Alaska in the north to Tierra del Fuego on the tip of the southern continent. Growing from a Pacific Coast network of 83 stations in 1942 to approximately 450 stations at the present time, this Sunday program now reaches well over 4 million listeners. And friends, we praise God that recently, in fact, during the past month, 23 new radio stations were added as Voice of Prophecy outlets. Three languages are now being used to carry this radio message of Bible prophecy, the English, the Spanish, and the Portuguese. Is this not a fulfillment of the prophecy of Revelation 14, 6, and 7? And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Literally, the gospel is flying through the air into hearts and homes everywhere. And we trust, friends, that the message of the voice of prophecy is one of, well, of hope as well as warning. Please pray that God will take care of our program as we pray that God will take care of you. Be not dismayed, whatever be God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day or all the way. He will take care of you. God will take care of you through days of toil. Yes, friend, God will take care of you, and God will take care of that son or that husband of yours overseas. And now, the voice of prophecy. The seven golden candlesticks of Bible prophecy, what can they represent? As we open that last wonderful book of the New Testament, the book of Revelation, we find the Apostle John reporting a vision of coming world events. And by the way, the word revelation itself is from the Greek word apocalypsis or apocalypse, and means the unfolding or the drawing back of the veil or the curtain. And now we come to the first vision in chapter 1. The curtain of the future is rolled back, and the holy apostle sees seven golden candlesticks. Let's read it in his own words. In the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, and he had in his right hand seven stars. Verse 13 to 16. 
Then John goes on to describe the overwhelming beauty and majesty of his glorified Lord and says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. O friend, Christ is not dead. He is alive forevermore. He passed through the grave, but he did not stay there. He arose again. He came forth a victor and declares that he has the keys of death's dark prison. And in his resurrection is the promise of ours. As we read in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the firstfruits of them that slept. When the garden tomb outside the gates of Jerusalem was discovered in 1885 by General Gordon, he was convinced that this was the place where the body of Christ had lain. It had been hidden for centuries and was covered with rubbish 20 feet deep. After this had been cleared away, all the dust from within the tomb itself was collected with great care and shipped to the Scientific Association of Great Britain, where it was carefully analyzed. But it was found to contain no traces of human remains. If this should be the real tomb of Christ, Joseph's new tomb, then Jesus was the first to be laid there, and he was also the last. How this vision must have thrilled the heart of John, who loved Christ so much, and had not seen him through the long, long years since that goodbye on the Mount of Olives. He feels the hand of his glorified Lord upon his head. Can you imagine his feelings, his thoughts at such a moment? As he might say, yes, it's he, it's the Master. He still lives, he still loves me. But the message of the vision is not for John only. It's for all believers in all the seven ages to the end of time. John listened, and so must we. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. You see, this is really a vision of the seven candlesticks, the seven churches, and really means a picture of the ever-present Christ. The seven churches evidently cover the whole history of the church to the second coming of Christ, one church age succeeding another through seven successive ages or changes of church history. When the Apostle John was exiled to the Isle of Patmos, he was evidently the elder shepherd over the churches of the province of Asia. And the Spirit chose for this prophecy seven leading churches of that province whose names and experiences are symbolic of the seven periods of church history from the time of the apostles to the last days. Seven is the Bible number of completeness. And when we read all of the second and third chapters of Revelation, we see that the messages to the last two or three of the churches deal with the approach of the second coming of Christ. By carefully comparing all seven of these prophetic previews with the actual history of church affairs, from the time of Christ to the present, it's quite clear that the following outline is approximately correct. The period of the church of Ephesus covers the apostolic age up to about 100 A.D. Smyrna, the period of papal or pagan persecution, especially during the second and third centuries. Pergamus, from the emperor Constantine's time on for several centuries. Thyatira, the period of church influence during the confused centuries of the so-called Dark Ages. Sardis, the time of the Reformation. Philadelphia, the period of the great Second Advent Awakening and Revival. Laodicea, the last age preceding the second coming of Christ. The message to each church has its lesson for that church to follow and for those that come after. The name of each church and the message given to it by Christ give us, first, a prophetic history of the city name, then, second, of the local church found in it, and third, the real inside history of a period of the church universal. It's easy also to see that each of these seven church messages or letters is divided into seven parts. First, the address. Second, a description of Christ. Third, the praise or commendation. Fourth, the reproof or condemnation. Fifth, an exhortation or call to repentance. Sixth, an appeal to hear or pay attention to the message. And seventh, the promise of reward. Now let us consider these seven candlesticks of churches one by one. Ephesus, the first, means desirable and rightly symbolizes the church of the apostolic age, pure in doctrine, active in God's service. To this church, Christ represents himself as he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, reading Revelation 2, 1. Like a golden candlestick, the church is to hold up the light of God's word to men. As long as the church is a candle of the Lord in this dark world, Christ is in it. 
And he holds the true Christian ministry in his right hand, for the seven stars are the seven angels or ministers of the seven churches. When things go hard, remember, fellow minister of God, that as long as you are true to the light, nothing can ever really harm you, for you are in the hand of Christ, the mighty, pierced hand. He holds you ever in his loving care, so do not worry. Just keep praying, keep trusting. I heard the voice of Jesus say, Come unto me and rest. Lay down, thou weary one. Lay down thy head upon my breast. I came to Jesus as I was weary. the second church period represents a time of suffering for the people of God. The word Smyrna means myrrh or perfume. Christ represents himself in this period as the one who was dead and is alive. He promises a crown of life to those who are faithful unto death. And multitudes did give their lives for their faith during those ten terrible years of persecution from A.D. 303 to 313. The Emperor Diocletian even went so far as to strike off medals bearing the words, The Christians are no more. One young martyr of those times was Blandina, a fifteen-year-old girl, who would not under any torture give up her faith in Christ, but continued to say, I'm a Christian. No wickedness is carried on by us. They turned a ravenous lion loose upon the poor child, but she looked into its face and smiled and wouldn't touch her. Then she was scourged, burnt in a hot iron chair, cast before a furious bull which tossed her madly. And even when her lingering throb of life had to be taken by a sword at last, she had been faithful all the way through. Her body was burned to ashes, cast into the Rhone River. But they could not rob her of the blessed hope and the promise to the martyrs of Jesus, I will give thee a crown of life. Pergamus, the third church, meaning height or elevation, a time of worldly favor, for the emperor Constantine professed Christianity and the days of pagan persecutions were over. Thyatira, the fourth age, a word which signifies sweet sacrifice of labor or contrition, referring to the thousands of faithful believers during the dark times of confusion and spiritual apostasy. It was a time of intolerance and bloodshed over religious differences. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 22, speaking of this period, Except these days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. The modern age came on with its civil and religious liberty, and the days of trouble were shortened. Sardis, the fifth church, signifying that which remains, covers the churches of the Reformation. The Holy Spirit, friends, is the life of the church and was needed in that age. And so we read here of Christ representing himself to this age as one who has the seven spirits of God. And so we can sing that beautiful old hymn, Come Thou Soul Transforming Spirit. We do need the Holy Spirit in our lives today. And then we hurry on to the sixth church period, Philadelphia, meaning brother love. And how well this does represent the period of the great advent awakening and revival, which reached its great climax before the middle of the 19th century. And friends, we cannot spend more time on this particular thing, but remember at that wonderful period, the great Advent movement announcing the coming of Christ began to go to all the world. 
The visions of Daniel were preached in the world. The great 2300-day prophecy reaching down to 1844. The cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary. The opening of the judgment hour in heaven. All these great truths began in the Philadelphia period. Laodicea, the seventh and last church. The name means the judging of the people. Jesus here calls himself the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Oh, friend, we are never to forget that Christ is witness to our lives. Will he be able to witness for you before the judgment bar of God and plead against the record of your sins? Father, my blood, my blood. We are living in the judgment hour that began under Philadelphia. Now in this solemn judgment hour, I wonder, friends, in this hour of the judging of the people, this Laodicean hour, are we sending our sins on beforehand to God? Are we ready because we are covered with his precious blood? To the church of a lukewarm age, Christ brings a message of warning and appeal. Christ is the beginning, that is, the head or author of all creation. Without him was not anything made that was made. John 1, 3. He who created all things urges us here to permit him to create us new creatures in him. He says to those in these last church days, the days of Laodicea, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Revelation 3.20. I wonder, friend, are you keeping the door unlocked? unlatched so that he, the waiter in Laodicea, may come in the door. We are living now in the prophetic period of the seventh and last church, and Jesus our Savior stands knocking for admittance at many a heart's door in Laodicea. Radio friend, if you have not yet done so, will you not open the door of your heart and let him in? If you could see Christ standing here tonight, his thorn-crowned head and pierced hands could view, could see those eyes that beam with heaven's own light and hear him say, Beloved, t'was for you. Would you believe and Jesus receive if he were stunned?
Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace.